So, hey folks, uh, wel uh, welcome to the talk on Project Acoustics. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, we're both uh, really, really excited to be talking to you about some new technology that we've uh, integrated with Unreal 5. Um, and we're going to get into that a little bit. Before I begin, I just want to give a thanks to uh, Aaron and Grace and the team at, at Epic. They've done a tremendous effort in, in helping with this collaboration. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, Kyle's been like deeply working with them in, in a very, very tight collaboration. And uh, the stuff that we're presenting today would not have been possible without a lot of their effort on their end. So really appreciate that. All right. So maybe we can begin just by giving like some brief introductions. Like Kyle, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Kyle Stork. I, I do not work at Epic, I work at Microsoft, but Epic is awesome and I'll wear any swag that they give me. Um, I've been at Microsoft for about nine years, working on audio the whole time. But then four years ago, I moved on the Project Acoustics team and I've been there ever since. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Drew, uh, Andrew Allen. Uh, I've been jumping from different places, working as a spatialization, ambisonics, and audio codec researcher. Um, so I'm very, very happy to join the Project Acoustics team as their DSP engineer. So uh, let's get on into it. So I'd love to just talk to you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. So first, we're going to give you a nice overview about Project Acoustics, what it actually is, how it works, how you would utilize it in your system. We're going to get into, Kyle's going to get into the details of how to implement Project Acoustics within your Unreal Audio uh, native project. Um, he's going to walk you through the whole process. Um, so by the time you're through with this, you're going to feel like experts. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the new source data override interface that we utilized in order to, to make use of our plugin. And he's also going to demonstrate how to utilize Project Acoustics and Acoustics data within Metasounds. Um, and so for any of you creative sound designers out there, you know, thinking about how you can incorporate acoustics as part of the generative component of your sounds, I'm sure you're your heads are firing with all sorts of ideas from that. Um, then we're going to jump back to me. I'm going to talk a little bit about our latest offerings in our fall release for Project Acoustics. Um, that's going to include a new spatial reverb system. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what that is, how you can use it, how you can use it with, with other systems as well. Um, and we're going to talk about our new uh, spatialization plugin for Unreal 5 as well and talk about the latest, greatest technology there. So first, just giving a little overview about Project Acoustics. Um, so what this, what this system is, is this allows you to bake accurate acoustics for any 3D geometry or scenes that you might be creating. And this uses a, a, a very highly accurate and, and uh, physically uh, related wave acoustics simulation system. Uh, all of this gets baked offline, and you run a very, very lightweight runtime system, which queries these acoustic data points across your system. So if your listener's here and your sound source is here, the only thing that you're doing in real time is basically just looking up a table. And you're getting the acoustic data right away, because we've already done the work for you. Um, in addition to that, there's designer controls on top of that that let you fine tune that process. Um, and this can be done either with Azure or local baking. Kyle will get into the details on that. And lastly, uh, we offer uh, Project Acoustics both for Unreal Native Audio as well as Unreal Wise. So if you are more familiar with one or the other, feel free to try whichever one is more comfortable for you. For the Unreal Native offering, we offer uh, the plugin directly on the Unreal Marketplace. So you don't have to go to no, no other extra links. It's just right there within the UE interface. Just click it, download it, and start playing. OK, first, let's talk a little bit about acoustics on a sort of a big picture uh, standpoint. So uh, we're all familiar with how, you know, how the, the geometry around us affects the qualities of sounds produced in that environment. Um, and we also all know the frustrations of trying to carve that out manually uh, as sound designers or, or game designers. Uh, one of the things that Project Acoustics really enables for, for designers is it allows you to just think about it in this terms, that you can uh, start with your creation, that is your game environments, uh, the sound sources that would be placed in that environment, right, and just let you design that component. We handle this component of propagation, which is the, the simulation of, of the propagation of waves from those sound sources through the environment, how it interacts with the walls, diffracts around corners, scatters across rough surfaces, that kind of thing, and eventually arrives at a sound field at the listener. Um, 
which is then rendered around you, and it can be rendered to whatever spatialization you use, whatever occlusion plugins you use, whatever reverb plugins you might want to use. We offer essentially a, a, a metadata layer on top of that, which provides the acoustic data that can then drive those things in a physically plausible way. So how does this fit into the game? So think about it this way. For if you have a, once you've computed all of uh, this, once you've run the simulation, we cook everything down to a really simple component where you have a source position, a listener position, and some metadata about the world, like the material properties of the walls and, and other uh, acoustic properties of the space. All of this gets fed into our propagation engine, which produces a set of acoustic data that's specific for that pair, listener source pair. Um, all of this then goes into the sound asset pipeline that you already have in place, so whatever sound assets you're playing, building it through whatever built-in effects you might be using, whether it's occlusion or portaling or reverb or other types of game syncs that you're running, sending it to your multi-channel or object mix, whatever you might be using. Um, we just simply take that acoustic data that we computed and we just modify the parameters of those uh, built-in effects so that they match what the expectation would be for the, for the acoustics of that scene. Additionally, with our latest offering, we also have a, a side chain that goes into our custom plugin for this spatial reverb, uh, since that is a little bit, a little bit new and, and fancy. Uh, so we offer our own version of that, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that actually gets utilized shortly. So what's the real value of all this? Just to reiterate, we get really, really high immersion with natural acoustics. Um, all of the simulation that you're getting is, is tied to how you would compute this at a, at a very, very high level scientific way. Um, so we get really, really high precision um, up to whatever precision you're, you're looking for. Um, what does this mean for you as a sound designer? It's going to reduce your markup time, right? You're not having to worry about creating attenuation radii. You're not creating reverb zones. You just bake and play, right? And then on top of that, we have those designer controls. So you have a wider palette as a sound designer to sort of carve out exactly the kind of aesthetic that you're going for. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kyle, who's going to walk you through the process of how you institute Project Acoustics within your scene. Kyle. Yeah. Let's switch. All right, so Project Acoustics. It's a plugin for Unreal, and there's an editor component and a runtime component. I am going to walk you through the editor workflow. So this is the process that you go through in, an edit in editor to set up that acoustics bake. So there's four main stages, object tagging, material selection, probe and voxel layout, and the bake stage. So we're going to walk through each of those. First stage, um, for object tagging, you need to tag all the geometry in the scene. So you need to specify um, which objects you want to be included in the acoustic simulation. So that's normally floors, ceilings, and walls. So your static meshes of the scene. So you want to tag all of those. Next, you want to tag the nav mesh. We want to know this because we want to know all the possible places in the level that a player can go. And we want to know that because we will target our acoustic simulation for those areas as a cost saving measure. You can manually do this, but if you already have a nav mesh, that's the easiest way to do it. Next is material assignment. So when you selected all those static meshes, we pulled out all the materials that went with those static meshes. And you then have to assign a corresponding acoustic material to go with those real materials. And that acoustic material will define how reflective or absorbent that material should sound in the simulation. Next, probe and voxel layout. This is a compute, uh, yeah, com compute step that takes place locally on your computer. And this needs to be done before the bake, so we kind of call it the pre-bake, and this will set up your scene for the bake. I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Then finally is the bake stage. So the bake stage is where that acoustic simulation takes place. And that either can happen in Azure or it can ha happen locally on your PC. So now let's see that in action in the editor. So in these videos, um, this is the Lyra starter project. So in these next couple of videos, it's essentially walking through the minimum steps to set up Lyra with Project Acoustics. So let's start. All right, so to start, um, open up Project Acoustics, open up the Acoustics mode, and then you see um, our Acoustics window here on the left. There's four tabs for those four main stages. So the first stage, objects. We need to tag all the objects in the scene. We have these bulk selection helpers. So I will select all the static meshes. So all the static meshes get selected. 
and I will tag these as geometry. You can see that now we have around 2,000 objects tagged for geometry. Next, navigation. We want to find that navigation mesh. We have a helper for that. So we found the navigation mesh. Now we want to tag that for navigation. Now we have objects tagged for geometry and navigation. And that's you need to have both of those tagged to continue. So next step is materials. Materials, so we pulled out all the materials from all the objects you selected. Now you need to assign a corresponding acoustic materials. So we'll try to do a simple strain matching. So if the material had concrete in it, we'll match it to the concrete preset. So you can use those. You can manually um, set which ones didn't get set. And then we have a custom one where you can find your own um, acoustic, acoustic coefficient. So the acoustic coefficient, um, that defines how reflective or absorbent um, that material should sound. A value of 0 means it's really um, reflective, and a value of 1 means it's really absorbent. Next, the probes tab. So this is that compute step that takes place locally in editor. So we'll start this, and it'll finish in a few seconds. So this compute step, it creates all those voxels, and it places <coughs> the probes. Um, it doesn't take too long. It depends on the size of your scene, but somewhere between 10 seconds and a couple minutes. But when it's done, you can see all the probes. These are the blue boxes. And then if we turn on the voxels, you can see all the voxels. So we'll start with the voxels. The voxels just simplify the geometry for the acoustic simulation. We don't need all the detail of real geometry, so we simplify it into these boxes. And then the blue, blue boxes, these are probes. And these are kind of seed points where we do the acoustic simulation. And these, we have a probe placement algorithm that will try to place these probes in all the right spots. Um, and these are placed pretty much up two meters above your nav mesh. Um, if the probe placement algorithm misses a couple spots, we do allow you to place, to manually place individual probes. We have a pinned probe actor for that. Uh, so once that's done, you can continue on with your bake. In our plugin, we offer built-in integration with uh, Azure Batch. So you just need to enter in your Azure credentials, and then it will send that bake to the cloud, do the bake in the cloud, and then return the resultant acoustics data. So the best way to configure that is each probe can run in parallel. So this map has 464 probes. So if you could, you can assign a VM for each one of those probes. So each one of these probe simulation will take about two minutes. So two minutes, each probe gets its own VM. Your bake will be done in two minutes. And, and then you have to add up all the startup cost and everything. But that's the power of using the cloud, is this bake can be done really fast. If you don't want to use Azure, we now give you the option to do the bake locally. So we have this tab here in the bottom. There it is. This will help you set up a local folder on your machine. And in that, in that folder, we'll put all the right files. And then you need to download some extra tools provided by us. And that allows you to do a bake locally on your computer. That will obviously take a lot longer, because it will do each probe um, in serial right after each other. Um, but for small maps, it's reasonable. I do local bakes all the time. Um, and a lot of people have been using local bakes with our Marketplace plugin. So um, once you have your acoustics data file, um, it's an asset that can be imported, imported into your project. These are um, four acoustics data files. So to add this acoustics data into your scene, you just need to add an acoustic space actor to your scene. And then on that acoustic space actor, you just need to slide in that acoustics data into the right slot. And that's it for setting up your scene for acoustics. Um, OK, so now let's just put that into a nice big diagram. So um, the input to the system, the geometry, materials, and nav mesh, uh, we voxelize and probe, do probe layout. The output of this is the probes and voxels. This is all done locally on your machine. And then this, the probes and voxels, are the input to the bake. The bake gets done on some sort of compute cluster, whether it's Azure or your own custom compute cluster or locally on your machine. The output of this is the acoustics bake file. And then this acoustics bake file contains all the possible parameters in that scene. All the acoustic parameters are saved in this ACE file, and you can query based on your source and listener position. And you can use the acoustic parameters as they are, the default values that we provide, but you can also change them. So we give you designer controls. We give you sliders. So if you want to make the sound wetter or if you want it to sound more occluded, you can do that with designer controls. Then the final step is how do we use these acoustic parameters to render? So now let's talk about that. 
so in the past, our, our first offering for Project Acoustics used um, WISE. But something we've always wanted is to use Project Acoustics natively in Unreal without a dependency on external middleware. And that's what we worked, we started working on with Epic about a year ago. So yeah, we didn't want to use middleware. We just want to use our acoustics data and as much Unreal native DSP as possible. And so we started working with Epics, thinking about how we could do this. So in, in Unreal, there's the concept of audio extension plugins, uh, the spatializer, reverb, and occlusion. And yeah, we could use these, but with these, you're kind of expected to provide DSP. And we didn't really want to provide our own DSP. We want to use as much Unreal native DSP as possible. So um, Epic and us had an idea, let's just make a new one. And we did. And it's called the Source Data Override Plugin. It's, it's quite a name, but we'll explain um, the reason for that name. And yeah, it's just really cool working with Epic, because we came up with this idea, and then we threw it in there, and it was live in the source code in a week. So it's just really cool to work with them. So this source data override interface. Um, so we, when we say source data, it mean we're talking about sound source data. And if you're looking in the code, it's called the wave instance, the F-wave instance. And on this F-wave instance are all the possible audio properties that you care about. Location, orientation, all the different attenuations like distance and occlusion, um, sound source effects, submixes, all of these are stored on that wave instance object. and this source data override interface allows you to override any one of those properties to achieve um, whatever you're trying to achieve. So here's that interface. And it's just like the other interfaces, the other um, plugin interfaces in Unreal. There is an initialize. There's initialize and release per source. And then finally, um, the get source data overrides call. So this is kind of like a process call. This is where this happens in every frame. And this is where all the action happens. So on this call, you can see that we get a pointer to the F-Wave instance. So that means we could, you could change whatever you want on this F-Wave instance. So you get a lot of power with this plugin. And you can do a lot of bad stuff if you um, use this improperly. But like they say, with great power comes great responsibility. So let's talk about um, how we use this. So this is, we've zoomed in on the right side of that um, architecture diagram from before. We have our acoustics bake file. You get the acoustic parameters out of it. And now we have the sound source data, which is provided by the source data over at interface. And what we do is we use our acoustic parameters and we change certain properties of the sound source data. And then the sound source data gets passed through the rest of the Unreal Audio engine. And an important part of this is um, the, source the get source data override call happens at the beginning of the processing pass. So any changes we make will then be active will be live when the rest of the Unreal Audio engine um, finishes its processing. So that's spatializer, reverb, submix, all that processing happens after you get your source data override. So now let's dive in even deeper into how we do this. On the left are our acoustic parameters. There are seven of them right now. They're separated into, into drawing wet categories, things like distance, arrival direction, and loudness. And then on the right are the main acoustic effects that we are trying to achieve. Portaling, occlusion, and reverb. And we're going to talk about how we use our acoustic parameters to achieve each of these effects with the source data override. So first for portaling, we take distance and arrival direction. And with that, we can create a new geometry-aware arrival direction. So this new geometry-aware arrival direction um, it's aware of the geometry, it's, so it's not a straight line between source and listener. This line will then go around corners instead of going through the corner. And what we all, all we have to do is override the location property of the wave instance. So we set our new project acoustics location to this location property. And what's cool is this location property then gets passed on to whichever spatializer you're using. So we don't do the spatialization. We pass on our project acoustics location to whatever spatializer you have selected, whether it's Google Resonance or simple ITD. Uh, yeah, so that's portaling. Next, occlusion. For occlusion, we need dry and wet loudness. And with that, we can calculate an occlusion value. And what we do is we directly set the occlusion attenuation on the object. And so, so unlike spatial, spatialization, um, Occlusion doesn't get sent to the occlusion plugin, so either you use some occlusion plugin or you use our occlusion attenuation. And then finally, reverb. This one is a little, little bit more involved. Three parameters, dry loudness, wet loudness, and decay time. 
decay time defines how um, long a sound reverberates in, in that space. And with these properties, we um, drive the sends into a bank of convolution reverbs. So we have pretty much three convolution reverbs with customized R's of different lengths, short, medium, long, and we drive the sends into each of these convolution reverbs based on the reverb that we calculate with our parameters. And these submixes are stored on a vector on the wave instance. The wave instance has a vector of submix sends, and that's where we um, provide our own um, custom submixes that have that are using Unreal built-in convolution reverb. So you might notice there's two unused ones. We do start to use these with spatial reverb, which Drew will talk about in a little bit. All right, so now let's finish our setup. So where are we? So we have our acoustic space. We added the acoustic data onto the acoustic space. Now we want to finish the setup for source data override. So go into your platform settings, and for Windows, you need to make sure that, oh, you can't see it, sorry, at the bottom there, um, set um, the source data override plugin to Project Acoustics. And then the final step, you want to opt in all your sound sources that you want to use Project Acoustics with the source data override plugin. So to do that, you go into your attenuation settings, and in your attenuation settings, there's now a new attenuation category for source data override. So just make sure that that's enabled, and then that sound source will receive Project Acoustics effects. So, and that's pretty much all you have to do. So this is the Lower Starter Project. I added Project Acoustics to the pistol, um, the rifle, and the shotgun sound effects. And then that was it. That was pretty much all I had to do. I think I turned off some of the reverb volumes that came with the scene, but that's, um, this is what Project Acoustics sounds with, sounds like in Lyra, out of the box. And then um, in the top left there, it says, I'm going to toggle when acoustics is on and off. So when it's on, you hear all, all of our effects. And when it's disabled, um, there's no project acoustics, acoustics happening. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We have better demos later, so let's go bad. So next, meta sounds. So this is a cool little experiment we added. Project acoustics and meta sounds. Um, so here's a really simplified high-level overview of how this all works. You have your sound source. You send the audio and the audio properties through our project acoustics plugin. And we use our acoustic parameters to add portal in, inclusion, and reverb on top of that. And if you want to do that with a meta sound source, sure, that still works. Um, the meta sound generates its sound, and then it gets sent through the Project Acoustics plugin like normal. But what if you wanted to use Project Acoustics within your meta sound, within all that meta sound logic? Specifically, what if you wanted to use the acoustic parameters? Well, that's now possible. Um, we can send, we can inject acoustic parameters into your meta sound as an interface to your meta sound. So let's talk more about that. So these are the acoustic parameters, and then meta sounds. It has the concept of interfaces, input and output interfaces. And Project Acoustics is now a new interface if you use our plugin. So you can throw any of our acoustic parameters right into your meta sound and receive the latest acoustic parameters as the scene goes on. OK, so I have a demo of that. Um, a silly little demo I made of possible ways to use these acoustic parameters. So let's start that. So we can see the new Project Acoustics interface and all of our parameters. You can throw these into your scene. And then these are just variables, input variables that get updated as the scene goes on. And so this meta sound I made, it's, it's a cricket sound effect. And um, I got inspiration from Dan Reynolds' YouTube videos. He has a lot of great YouTube videos that I learned a lot from. And I borrowed one of his cricket designs. So the input to this cricket is just a single chirp like that. And then this meta sound will duplicate that, put the chirps into a group, and then repeat that chirping group 
um, forever so we can listen to what it sounds like. Yeah, there's some parameters to it, like the pitch. And the core logic of this is in this patch. So this is kind of the design I borrowed from Dan. So to create that repeat in Cricut Chirp, it's just a bunch of trigger delays and trigger repeats, pretty basic stuff. Um, that's not the important part. The important part is that I parameterize some of these, um, some of the properties of a chirp, like the pitch and then a couple other things, and I drive those parameters with our acoustic parameters. So for instance, um, the pitch. So my, my thinking was, it's, it's a cricket, and if the cricket is occluded from you, which means the, click, the cricket can't see you, the cricket should feel safe, so it's going to chirp at a lower frequency. But if the cricket is unoccluded from you, like the cricket can see you, it's going to be scared, and it's going to chirp at a higher frequency. So I use project acoustic seclusion using dry loudness and wet loudness. I do some math on those to get an occlusion value 0 to 1. And then I map that 0 to 1 to the frequencies that we want, so higher frequencies for when the cricket is unoccluded. And that's how I drive the pitch of the chirp. And then the other behavior I drive is when the cricket goes silent. So I was thinking that if you get too close to a cricket, um, it's going to go silent because it's scared. So we have the, pro the acoustic parameter of path length. And path length is an, a geometry aware, pat, uh, uh, geometry aware distance between the source and the listener. So a distance that goes around corners instead of through the corner. So I use this path length to drive when the cricket goes silent. And yeah, those are the two behaviors I made, and we're going to see them in the sample scene. So in the sample scene, um, a cricket is going to spawn randomly around me. There it is right in front of you, um, that small sphere by the stairs. And listen to how the pitch of the chirp changes as we move around the geometry, and also when we get too close to the cricket. And then if you get too close, you, you squash it. <laughs> so yeah, all, all that logic was driven with Project Acoustic Parameters and Metasounds. So um, yeah, so, so it's one of the powers of occlusion is it's not, the occlusion isn't binary, it's, it's degrees. So as you get closer around the corner, the occlusion value gradually creeps up. So you get more um, variation in the occlusion. So yeah, that's it. Now back to Drew. All right. No actual crickets were harmed in the production of that demo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about our uh, upcoming release offering for Spatial Reverb, um, which will be available in our fall release. Um, so what do I mean by Spatial Reverb? Well, what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about something not stereo, not quad, not a dome. I'm talking about an object-based, directionally aware reverb, okay, which can then be ported to any spatialization plugin. Okay, it's independent of, uh, of whatever HRTF set you might want to use. Um, so you can drive it to your, your preferred binauralizer or a 7.1 mix or stereo or whatever, whatever you uh, prefer on your device. Um, these are driven by per source acoustic parameters. So for each source that, um, that you send to the spatial reverb, you, have, you, you can control its decay time between a quarter second and three seconds. Um, its loudness, obviously, as well as its arrival direction. Uh, relative to the listener and and the spread over that sort of sphere around the head and um, this is different than saying oh this is just per source reverb no this is a really really high uh, a really really efficient uh, and high quality reverb where it does not scale you know exponentially with the number of sources you pay effectively a fixed cost all of your sources get mixed into this thing and you still get this nice high fidelity uh, sharpness uh, for each of those sources. And the way I like to think about this is you can also think about spatial reverb as a way of, of very effectively producing wet portaling um, separate from dry portaling. Uh, to enable this inside the settings for our SDO plugin, you just select reverb type. The default for reverb type uh, will be, would be stereo convolution, and you would just switch it to spatial reverb, cut that on, choose your quality. We'll talk about quality modes in just a second, and you're good to go. 
Uh, and then you can just choose whatever spatialization plugin you want, and it will automatically dispatch to that. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works. Um, so what are the outputs of this system? Um, so we actually render a multi-channel set of virtual loudspeakers um, that represent this, this reverberant sound field around your head. And these are virtual loudspeakers that follow your position, but do not rotate with your head. Okay. So the idea is, you know, I can produce things that are cardinally aware, and I can still apply that head rotation. Um, this is similar to anybody who's worked with ambisonics or anything like that. You'd be familiar with this, this kind of like rotation-locked, listener-centric kind of sound field. Um, we have two quality modes. Uh, we have the high quality, the best quality mode, which uses a 12-point tetrahedron. Uh, as well as a three-point, which gives you horizontal accuracy, but you know you lose verticality. Um, the three-channel version is effectively the same cost as your stereo reverb, so you, you're not paying any any more to get spatial reverb at that mode, and you're paying marginally more for this 12-channel. But it's not actually a 4x multiplier. Uh, we do some we do some clever trickery to keep the computational costs down. Uh, how this is actually implemented in the architecture is um, each of your input sources. This is not anything you necessarily have to worry about, but if you're curious, I can inform you. Uh, all of the input sources come in on these uh, 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 Unreal, uh, 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 Unreal classes known as source buffer no listeners. Uh, the source buffer listeners then are piped into our SDO plugin. E the individual acoustics are then queried for those sources, so we get, in addition to what Kyle was talking about before for wet parameters, so you get loudness, decay time, arrival direction, and spread. All of those then get computed into the spatial reverb plugin, and we output a set of virtual speakers um, to these source bus classes, which are then treated effectively as um, standard sound objects inside Unreal, which can then be further processed, can be spatialized, can be dispatched to whatever uh, kind of panning or spatialization system you might want to use. So, uh, and all of these are still driven by those same acoustic uh, properties that we saw before. So the idea is that um, in the same way as, as you would expect in a space, as you start in a narrow space, you have a tight spread going down a hallway. As you enter into a larger room, the spread can open up naturally, and all of this is super smooth in the same way that occlusion is smooth and, and portaling and all of that. Um, so let's take a listen to a couple demos. And in these, what, I've, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you uh, a stereo variation of a scenario and then the spatial reverb. Obviously, we're, we're working with, uh, with a stereo PA system, so you'll, um, you'll just kind of have to you know, squint really hard with your ears and, and be able to <laughs> sort of pretend you can hear that, that spatialization. We're just passing this through Unreal's built-in simple ITD spatializer. Um, but I want you to pay really close attention to uh, variation that you hear between the speakers, especially as the head's turning in the stereo versus the, the non-stereo. So let's first listen to the stereo scenario. You're going to be in, an, in a larger space, and then you're going to walk around a barrier and go into a smaller space with the source in it. Let's take a listen to that now. Okay, so something we've all heard at this point, and and certainly as as you as you're hearing, like as you get closer to the source, you know, like the, the clarity of the, the the wet dry balance is is you know matching, and and you're hearing all of that kind of stuff. But really, there's not a lot of variation in the reverb quality itself. You're really just kind of sort of hearing it just just fade up or down as as you explore. Let's hear it uh, the same scenario with spatial reverb enabled. So, yeah, you can, you can hear a little bit of that. Um, maybe you're imagining it, maybe you're not. When, when the fall release comes out, I really in insist you give it a try, and um, we'll have contact detail at the end, too. So um, this is an active development project, so I'm really open to feedback and, and uh, improvements that we can make. Let's take a listen to another scenario. This one, I think, will be even more cogent. We're going to walk through a glass tunnel in the Lyra scene. And the source will be placed in the middle. We're going to walk through the tunnel. And again, pay attention to those same qualities we just talked about. In the real world, humans use audiovisual cues to understand the world around them. A 
acoustics provide critical perceptual cues about the surrounding environment. In virtual worlds, combining spatial audio with acoustics increases user immersion, similar to how detailed wall textures with realistic object lighting do so on the visual side. The approach to acoustics described here is the tool that analyzes virtual worlds to create a realistic simulation of... Okay, so as before, pretty much what you would expect. There's a little bit of a difference of, of direct to uh, dry, dry to wet re uh, reverberant ratio there, but otherwise, you know, really just kind of fading up the reverb, fading down. Let's take a listen now with spatial reverb, um, which will account for as reflections are moving around in that glass tunnel. In the real world, humans use audiovisual cues to understand the world around them. Acoustics provide critical perceptual cues about the surrounding environment. In virtual worlds, combining spatial audio with acoustics increases user immersion, similar to how detailed wall textures with realistic object lighting do so on the visual side. The approach to acoustics described here is a tool that analyzes virtual worlds to create a realistic simulation of what the virtual world So, you can get a little bit of a sense of what's going on there. Uh, and yeah, we're, uh, we're actively developing it, but the, the, the initial release will be, will be available very soon for your, for your enjoyment. Uh, lastly, let's just talk a little bit about our spatialization plugin. Um, I think everybody in this room is pretty familiar with spatialization plugins, so I don't have to contextualize this too much, but I really want to show off uh, the exciting new research that we were able to pull off uh, recently. Uh, we have a new uh, variant of our spatializer that was powered by machine learning to produce a exceptionally high quality full sphere HRTF rendering for very, very low memory and compute costs. So what this is, is this is a 2048 point full sphere HRTF set um, that's comparable in performance to, to resonance. There's, you, uh, for no matter, uh, how many, no matter how many sources you have in your scene, uh, you get this high resolution uh, res uh, quality and you're paying four filters per ear. So uh, for the best quality, which uh, in, in our terms, we best means perceptually uh, indistinguishable or transparent versus the original HRTF set. We also have a good, which is nearly transparent. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even call it anything less than that. Um, so this is, this is my favorite slide. This is because I'm, I'm getting nerdy. Uh, we actually you say, well, how do you know it's perceptually transparent? How do you know it's as good as you're claiming it is? Well, we actually con conducted a user study as part of a, a paper project. Uh, my associate and I, uh, Mick Marchand, uh, we uh, published a paper this year at AES AVAR. You can uh, go to the proceedings for that conference and read more details about how we did this, you know, what, what uh, techniques were utilized, uh, what our uh, uh, machine learning topography looked like, and, and all of that. But here are the main results. The main results is, Previous to that, we were paying, uh, you know, a linear cost for each source that you pulled in, and as a result, you know, the time to render 100 sources could go up to 30 seconds for, for 10 minutes of audio. Um, this latest version, um, perceptually transparent to, uh, and, and imperceivably identical to, to that version, is a third of the cost. Um, for nearly transparent, you're paying, for 100 sources, you're paying what you used to pay for five. So um, this technology is, is uh, coming out on, uh, in our plugin. It's, it's going to be launched in Windows Sonic. And we, we actually are able to support now essentially hundreds of uh, individual object-based uh, spatializations uh, for very, very low computational cost. Uh, over on the right figure, you're seeing a 2D topography of the HRTF sphere. And as we slide around, you're kind of seeing um, the difference between the blue line, which is what our target HRTF phase res uh, magnitude response was, and this dotted orange line, which is what our approximation filter does. And you might see, oh yeah, I can see there's a couple of little differences there, but more or less it's following the same contours. Um, this study that we conducted ver uh, confirmed with very, very high statistical confidence that you cannot hear a difference between any of these, any of these filter settings. Um, so in addition to being a third of the cost, we actually threw away a ridiculous amount of the memory co compute as well. So we only use a, uh, 250 kilobytes as opposed to 16 megs. So for anybody who's working on really, really low, uh, uh, low spec requirement uh, uh, platforms, you know, this, this might be really good for you. Um, anyways, that's, that really concludes everything that we wanted to talk about today. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, we're going to just take any questions that you might have.